Yeah, let's get going back in our little series, um, our Hey Pax Legomenon series, our one and done is what I'm calling it. This is our second lesson in this little series on the Greek words used in the New Testament that make one appearance and then disappear from the scene, perhaps disappear from all of literature, as we saw our word last week. Um, I've been getting some good returns on this this week. This is, uh, I think, people kind of excited at the little change in theme and and the fact that you don't really know what's coming every week, but you know the general, uh, you kind of know the parameters, you know the rules. Um, it's made it fun for me to study too, because you know you go looking for words, they're, they're easy to find, and but which ones do you land on and why? And I'm not putting too much effort into that, to be honest. I'm, I'm not trying to overthink it. I find one, the little excitement flag runs up the flagpole in me. If it stays there half the week, I go, well, that's the one we'll do. And so that's what we've done these two weeks, and it's been a kind of a fun journey for me. Tonight's word um, will be one that is, of course, appears but once in our text and, and then does not appear again in the entire Bible until you start to dig into alternate translations. And I'm not talking about English translations, but all alternate ancient translations. And then it pops up again, but not in the New Testament. So that's how I whet your appetite for where we're going tonight. The other part is this, our, sub, our title tonight called Dead to Bookkeeping. This is a phrase that I will use near the end of tonight's lesson as we work our way towards this. You'll see why, I think, as we get into a, a very classic Jesus parable. Um, this, is a, this is a line right here that has really marked my journey in the last, I'd say, eight, ten months, maybe a year. Um, we all go through, if you're like me, you go through little seasons in your Christian walk. You go through spells where you're, maybe you're really into a book of the Bible. You, you know me, when I'm really into one, you're forced to hear it if you show up. Um, <laughs> I, I, or maybe you're really being challenged with something. You know, maybe your faith is being sharpened or you're wrestling with a concept. Um, and so, I need little things in my journey. I need little revelations. I need little epiphanies. I need little moments where I see Jesus clearly, and then I know I'm okay. I'm on the right track. I try not to judge my journey based on success in the metrics of the world, money, how many dates are being booked, how many books are being sold, you know, who's emailing. Um, I try to let the metric be peace, that I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. I know I'm saying what I'm supposed to say. And so I've found over the last several years, especially that the Holy Spirit brings these little things into my life that maybe they pop up in a book or maybe they pop up just out of nowhere. I don't know where they come from. And sometimes they are something I heard someone say I and mean, I can't shake it. And, and then it, it helps give me a little bit of a North Star. One of those has been the phrase dead to bookkeeping, a God who died to keeping the books. And I've had that phrase in my heart. Um, I think... The, the late, great Robert Farrar Capon, who we will quote a little bit at the end of the lesson tonight, but I want to give credit where credit is due, for really turning me on to that concept, to start to read the Bible, read the, the stories of Jesus through the lens of him telling about a God who dies and resurrects, that God makes himself man, dies as a man, and then resurrects as a new man, but that that God, through those stories, is showing, Jesus is showing us a God who's died to being a bookkeeper. He is no longer keeping tight books on your sin and your error and your faults, but has marked paid. And, and we get this ransom talk and redemption talk. And Paul rounds that out with all his accounting terms, like it's been accounted to you for righteousness. Your sins are not counted against you. All those counting phrases that really are saying God has closed the book, or maybe God just ripped the page out that had all your faults against it. And Paul would even say he nailed to his cross the enmity, the things that were against us. He nailed it to Jesus' cross. So for me, dead to bookkeeping without any scripture or without any stories, and we'll get to both, dead to bookkeeping means I, I'm saved by a God who has stopped keeping strict accounts of my failures and instead counts me righteous based upon my faith in His Son and the finished work of Jesus. And I have begun to live my life through that framework that if God is dead to the bookkeeping of Paul White, then Paul White should be dead to the bookkeeping of his neighbor. He should be dead to judging people based upon what he sees, and he should, he should die to keeping 
short accounts. So he should be quicker to forgive. He should be quicker to forget when he can. And when he can't, he should be quick to go to the God who has both forgiven and forgotten and take that piece of himself to the Father to say, I want to keep my books to look like heaven's books. In other words, I want to wipe slate clean with my brother or my sister. And for me, that has been, like I say, a North Star, a, a thing that I've been able to pull back to in this about the last year or so, maybe a little longer, um, of, of seeing God. And I've seen God through a lot of different lenses, but this has been a very big one for me. So tonight's lesson is not only a, 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 a hey, Pax Legomenon. It's not only a one and done. It's not only a moment where a Greek word pops up, it doesn't pop up again. It's a moment that lets us expand on an amazing Jesus parable because this is the front door. The word we're going to use tonight is sort of the front door to a parable that I want to land on. So let's begin with a statement from the Gospel of Matthew that is um, leading us to our word. We need this, though. We need... A bit of pretext. Let's do a little bit from Matthew. Let's do a little bit from Luke. Here's Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, there's a rabbinical tradition in the time of Christ that, had, that was teaching that you should forgive someone three times. If they, if they fail you, you forgive them. If they wrong you, you forgive them. If they do something to you, you forgive them. But after three... There was really no teaching. It was like three times seems to be a pretty good number. Um, I'll get into it in a little bit, maybe why Peter asks this from a contextual standpoint, but let's get into it as to why he asked Jesus specifically. Maybe it's because Luke tells this story, Luke 17, 1, and we'll do this, this little bit of work from Luke just to help us. Jesus said to his disciples, it's impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It, it would be better for that man if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. That's pretty big. Not too much commentary there other than to say sometimes it's, it, Jesus seems to say that there are fates worse than death. You know, that there's, there's things that you do that exponentially cause problems that would have been better off if you'd never done them at all. Keep that in mind because that's going to be key to tonight is that idea. Verse 3, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So maybe this is where Peter comes up with his Matthew 18 question. Hey, if, is seven enough? If somebody comes, sins against me seven times, should I forgive them seven times? Because Jesus has told this little story in Luke, and it doesn't appear as if it's the same story as Matthew 18. You understand Jesus preaches, he's a circuit preacher. And so Jesus would say something Kind of like a band. A band shows up in a city and plays a set list. And they tear everything down. They go to the next city and they play a set list. And they probably play the same set list that they played in the previous city. Preach, circuit preachers do the same thing. You preach a sermon in this town. You go to this town, you preach a sermon. The difference is <laughs> sermons don't come out the same as songs. And so there'd be times where Jesus would say something in one gospel. And he'd say the same thing in another gospel with a little twist. So don't look at the other one and go, who's wrong? Instead, look at it and go, huh, Jesus added a line. Second time you preach that. Because a lot of times that's what's going on. You're adding a line, you're taking something away. So there's a chance that this is a progression of thought for Jesus. It's a chance it's just a whole different teaching from Jesus. But that's probably what brings us to the Peter question, which is seven times. Does that sound good? Is, is seven enough? No, let's go back to the story. Reread Peter's question and give Jesus' answer from Matthew 18, 21, 22. Lord, how often if my brother sins against me and I forgive him, should I go up to seven times? And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but the 70 times seven, which of course has led people into paths of literalism, which is, you know, seven's a really big number to forgive somebody. Seven offenses, that's a lot of offenses from the same person. And Jesus goes, no, let's go 70 times seven, let's go 490 times. And if you're a literalist, then Jesus has expanded it to an absurd number, 490. Who, who puts up with 490 offenses from the same person? But good news is, you don't have to put up with 491 because if you get to 491, well, then you can just do whatever you want to them because you were pretty patient. I mean, you, you waited it out 70 times seven and that's more than anyone should ever expect. And Jesus is just trying to be absurd and go, uh, maybe at 491 you could do it and that, you know, winks and twinkle in his eye and then they move on with their lives. But there's, of course, as you know, a whole lot more going on 
than meets the eye. This brings us to our word for this week. And that is the word that gets translated 70 times. Sometimes a Greek word needs two English words, especially when the Greek word has 15 consonants and a couple of vowels in it. When the Greek word is hebdomi kontakas, followed by a second Greek word, hepta. So hebdomi kontakas, hepta. 70 times seven. The Greek phrase hebdomi kontakas, the English words 70 times, it never shows up again in the New Testament. Jesus using a phrase that we don't find elsewhere in the Gospels or the Epistles or the Revelation. Scholars have been really working with this for a long time. Greek experts working with this for a long time because as we just rendered it, it's 70 times 7 because that's the way the English sort of lays it out. 70 times 7 maybe equaling 490. But most likely, 70 times 7 and 7 times. Or you could say um, 70 times plus seven more times, which would equal 77 times. Now, in a Hebrew culture, which is what Jesus is, he's a Hebrew, and he's in a Hebrew culture, even though he's in a Roman world, they're really accustomed to numerology. Numerology is big, threes, twelves, fives. And so seven is obvious, because seven is perfection. Seven is completion. You march around Jericho seven times. You dip in the Jordan River seven times. God rests on the seventh day. There's sevens everywhere in the numerology that is a full number. So maybe Peter uses seven because he's a Jew and he's thinking, I'm going to use the perfect number. Should I forgive the perfect number? And Jesus goes, no, you shouldn't forgive the perfect number. You should do even better. You should perfection times perfection times perfection. So fullness times fullness times sort of an exaggerated amount in which you should forgive possibly. But they were also accustomed to hearing scripture from the Septuagint. And that matters because the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. I know I've probably told you this 20 times, but 21 won't kill you. And you never know when somebody's watching that missed those other 20. The Septuagint is a translation of, from the Hebrew text into Greek that occurred approximately 100 years before the birth of Christ. By the time of Christ, it would have been already have fairly saturated the synagogue world of Jesus' day, though the synagogues of Jesus' day didn't have complete copies of every Old Testament scroll. They had what they could get. And in a world without a printing press, in a world where everything that was copied was hand copied on what wouldn't be considered paper today, this didn't exist, not as that. Um, So reused scrolls and reused scraps and sun-dried leathers and whatever they could get, and so you rarely got entire copies. But what they did get was put in a language that most people in the world could understand because the most common written language of the world was Greek. And so the translators, it's called the Septuagint because that number means 70, and it was believed to have been translated by 70 Jewish scribes and elders who sat in a room and haggled over how to translate out of the Hebrew and into the Greek. And so we don't know how much of Hebrew text Jesus knew, but we can tell Jesus knew of the Greek because of the way he quotes the Old Testament. If you ever want to know whether the writers were quoting the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek Septuagint, just read the script next to your King James Old Testament. Because your King James Old Testament is translated out of Hebrew. And so if you're reading a quote from the New Testament and it doesn't sound like that Old Testament verse, it's very likely they weren't quoting from the same book you are. They were quoting from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which changed wording, which moved things around, um, sometimes famously moved things around in, in, to the point that if we read them from the Septuagint, we don't recognize them at all. Now, I bring all of that up because our word tonight uh, is nowhere else in the New Testament, but it is in the Septuagint a word that got translated out of the Hebrew and into the Greek. And I want to propose from the top tonight that I don't believe Jesus is just making up some fun number because he's Jewish and he throws a seven in there. I believe Jesus is quoting scripture or at least quoting a word he heard in the scriptures and no one else ever quotes it. And by quoting it, I think Jesus is contrasting the way 
He sees forgiveness with the way the system of the world runs itself. So much so that my initial title for most of today, for tonight's lesson was The Kingdom of Forgiveness. And I scratched that out and went, no, I'm going to go with my favorite dead to bookkeeping because that's been a sort of a guiding light for me. So, um, but the kingdom of forgiveness is, is, is important because everything you talk about, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of peace, gospel of the kingdom, it's all contrasted to current kingdoms. So you got to look at the current kingdoms of the world, the current systems, the way they do things. And then you look at the kingdom, which is always going to be opposite. So Jesus is introducing 70 times 7, let's call it 77, 70 plus 7. But he's not making up a number that's arbitrary. He's drawing. Let's draw with him. And to do it, let's do a lead-in read, okay? Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And I am not insulting your intelligence. I know you know the Cain story. But man, we need to read the Bible, okay? And so there's just too many times, I think, in church and Bible study where we go, you know, the Bible says, and then we throw out a verse. And it's okay to just read it once in a while, to really see it and soak it up. And so I challenge the viewer and the listener and all of you, get in your text and spend some time in it. Okay, don't read it for speed and don't read it for racking up verses. Just set with it. Set with this story for the thousandth time in your life. Cain has just killed Abel. Genesis 4, 9, the Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you're cursed from the earth, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. There's a lot happening here. There's a lot happening in the psychology of man. There's a lot happening in the history of the family of man. This is the first murder. Blood crying from the ground. This is God playing dumb with Cain. God knows what's happened, but God won't walk in and say what's happened because he wants you to say what happened because God being honest is common. You being honest is rare. So God being common is his default position. You being a liar is your default position. That's us. That's, that's the story. Is us going, I don't know. Uh, and not taking responsibility for our actions. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't, I don't have to deal with this stuff. And God won't leave the room. He goes, yeah, you do, because the blood's crying out. And someone, I'm listening to what's going on on the earth. And, so, and then a curse befalls Cain. And, and the curse is that he's, the, uh, the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood, you're cursed from it. And then the curse goes on to say this in verse 12. When you till the ground, it's not going to yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth, which sets murderers aside from their peers. It sets them as outsiders. It's not common. It's not ordinary. It's not the normal position of humanity to kill your brother. It's abnormal. It can't be viewed as just part of the human experience. And so the curse descends that life gets harder when you steal what isn't yours. This sets us up for the law, stealing, adultery, murder. That life gets exponentially worse as you commit that foul against the human family. Uh, and the earth will swallow you up. So all of it, all of it prophecy. And, and you'll be a fugitive and a vagabond. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. 14. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that Anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. And there, oh man, there's a lot happening here. Cain is the first marked man, but marked in a way in which it both shows that he's a murderer, but shows the mercy of God. It's one of the gr first great reflections of God's mercy on the unworthy in the scripture is to say, you deserve to die, but I'm going to mark you. A, same, a mark that gets alluded to again in the book of Revelation when the sealed of God are protected from the beasts of the earth and because of the mark that they've received. But it appears in the text, Cain, who says to God, this is more than I can handle. Everywhere I go, people are going to want to kill me. And, and it appears that God says, well, I, part of your curse is that if, part of the curse is if that someone kills you, they will be 
uh, they will have it visited upon them sevenfold. But God doesn't describe what he means. Sevenfold what? I mean, you can only kill somebody once. So if they kill Cain, what's God going to do? Kill him seven times? Does it mean God's going to kill them and their kid and their grandkid and their great-grandkid and their great-great-great? And we can play this game on and on. There's no explanation. This just hangs there in Genesis 4 that says, hey, what I will say to you is I'm going to mark you and anyone that kills you, there's going to be a sevenfold vengeance that falls on them. But it doesn't hang long. In fact, the text follows Cain. Genesis 4 is a fascinating read. It follows Cain out of Eden and into Nod, which is not to be lost on you if you're paying attention to Hebrew. Out of paradise, Eden, Hebrew, into Nod. East of paradise is not. Nod means wandering. When you leave paradise, you wander. And so the wanderer, Cain, wanders his way and builds the first city, first city of the earth is built on blood. It's why the Bible has a negative view of cities all the way up until there's a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven because the last thing God has to renew in the Bible is the city because the first one was built on blood. So the last one's going to be built on the blood of the lamb. That's a cool connection. So Cain gets married, has children. His genealogy starts to unfold in Genesis chapter 4. And then it gets down to one of his grandsons, a kid named Lamech. And Lamech gives us our first little song in the Old Testament. Two verses long from Genesis 4, 23, 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. I've killed a man for wounding me. Even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. All right, look at that. I killed a man who wounded me. I killed a young man who hurt me. There's already this number hanging over my great-great-grandfather Cain of a sevenfold vengeance. Well, it's worse now. It's a seventy-sevenfold vengeance vengeance that falls upon me now let's take a look at that word and there it is hebdomi kontakas the only other usage of this greek word in all of the bible but it's not found in the hebrew old testament it's found in the septuagint of course it is because the hebrew old testament isn't written in greek but the septuagint uses that word the scriptures of jesus's time would have used this word because jesus is hearing the septuagint when he's hearing the stories of Genesis and he hears that big Greek word. So I don't believe Jesus is coining a phrase. He's not coining a phrase. It existed at least a hundred years before him. Instead of coining a phrase, Jesus is repeating it. And I think that Jesus is redeeming it because here's the lead in to where we are in Matthew 18. Jesus tells an insane little story about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and loses one and leaves the 99 to go find it. So there's no, why is that an insane story? Because you don't leave 99 sheep to find one. Yes, that's, but Jesus does because he's describing a, this amazing kind of love, this, this, this lost sheep. And it says, it's the will of the Father in heaven that none of the little ones shall perish. So whatever he's got to do, he says, whatever he's got to do, he's going to go get the little one. That's the heart of the Father. This is how Jesus sets his story up. I'm just backtracking you in Matthew 18. All right, we're leading you up to Peter's question. So, so Jesus goes, my, it's my Father's will that none of the little ones perish, that all of them are saved, rescued. And then he tells a little story that has been used for about 2,000 years as justification for eventual excommunication for people in the church that we disagree with. And his story goes something like this. If a brother sins against you, um, go talk to him. And if he won't hear you and you can't resolve it, then go get one or two other people and go to him. And then if you still can't resolve it, then take him to the church, which is an interesting phrase because... 
Jesus is establishing the church. This is not like there's a church down the street. So it's, it's Jesus saying, bring him to the ecclesia. Bring him to the assembled ones. And then if that doesn't work, and, and the guy still doesn't really want to make up with you, then, well, um, treat him as a heathen and a tax collector. Which, like I said, for 20 centuries has given some branches of the church permission to go, look, we've tried this three times. We asked him, we went to him, we sat down with him, he didn't want to, he's kicked out, we don't want him anymore. But notice what Jesus said to treat him like. Treat him like a sinner and a tax collector. And then Jesus says, if any two or three of you agree on any one thing, then whatever you agree with on earth, that's what's going to happen for you in heaven. For Where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I'm going to be in the middle of you. And Jesus uses another cool Greek word that I would love to use in our series, but it's like five times in the New Testament. So I don't care to break rules, but that's insanity. Um, a, a word called uh, um, symponio, symphonio, where we get the English word symphony. Because Jesus says, if any two or three of you symphonio, on any one thing. If any two or three of you could just get your song together in the same key, heaven would move, which is a pretty cool principle. Like, if you could just get together on the same page, you could watch God do something. But as long as you pull against each other and you fight against each other, this isn't going to work. So if two or three of you could come together on this thing, heaven would move on your behalf. That's Jesus' story, to which Peter goes, hey, if a guy sins against me, is it good if I forgive him seven times? That was how we got here tonight. That's the lead up to that story. Start over without all the fat. We'll go all the way for one sheep. Start with one. One sheep. We'll go all the way for one sheep. The father will. Three times offenses happen. Treat him like a sinner and a tax collector. Peter goes, how about seven? Jesus goes, how about 77? One, three, seven, 77. What's happening? The number just keeps expanding. It's exponentially getting larger. And hint, in case you missed it, Jesus doesn't say excommunicate the guy. That's what we've done with the text. Jesus says, treat him like a sinner and a tax collector. How did Jesus treat sinners and tax collectors? And that's the rub that's often missed. Because if you've already got an idea about what you want to do with that guy, you've, you gave up on forgiving him long before the story was over, and you just found justification in Jesus' answer. But if you treat him the way Jesus treats tax collectors and sinners... And I think Peter gets the hint and goes, what about if we gave him seven chances? And Jesus, I think, winks and goes, how about we do better than that and give him 77? Not 77 actual chances, but how about if we flip Lamech's curse? Because that's the only other place this word exists in the Greek literature. Because it's a fundamental truth of the Genesis 4 story. That if you live by the sword, you die by it. But you don't die stab for stab. Things get worse. If you hurt your neighbor, he doesn't hurt you back. He hurts you and your kids. And then when you go hurt him, his kids, and their kids, then they come burn your whole house down and raise your village. And that's how the world works. Lamech gets it three generations later and goes, man, if it was bad under Cain, it's getting worse. It's 77 times vengeance now because the way of the world, the way of Cain, is exp exponential violence, exponential retribution. It doesn't go tit for tat. Israel, Jesus, I'm sorry, God pulls it down to eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He had to pull it down to eye for eye, tooth for tooth because it, it was out of control. And Jesus will take it even further and goes, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just leaves everybody without teeth and no eyes. What if we did better than that? Doing better than that would be the forgiveness of the kingdom. It says we've got to break out of this cycle. We've got to stop it with the Cain and the Lamech stuff because we're all going to be blind and we're all going to eventually be dead and there's no future in this. And that's 
the death spiral of Genesis 4. That's Cain going, this is more than I can handle. And God goes, you're right, it is. And the violence you perpetuate comes back at you. Jesus says as much to Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter, put the sword up. If you live by it, you die by it. Peter, this never ends well. This isn't the way. And so by saying 77, Jesus is introducing a, an inverted system. What if it was a forgiveness that was exponential instead of a vengeance that was exponential? Instead of harm brings more harm, brings more harm until everybody's harmed. What if forgiveness brought more forgiveness that brought more forgiveness until everybody was forgiven? What if we could change the world one forgiveness at a time? And so Jesus steps into the death of Abel. He becomes the new shepherd. Abel's a shepherd. He dies at the hands of Cain. He steps into the death of Abel so that he can flip that, so that he can come out the other side, resurrected, bringing his version of 77 to the world. Now, that leads to our parable. Now, I know that in our little one and done, what we're really doing is looking at one word that never appears again, and we're building a case off of that. As you can tell tonight, this word really just gets me to this next story. All of that was a gateway. That, that Greek word is a gate, as far as I'm concerned. Because after you go 1, 3, 7, 77, Jesus, as he commonly does, tells a story. The parables are fascinating. And you know what's so fascinating about them is that you never really land on the answer. I mean, if you think parables are supposed to be easy, you don't understand parables. They're not supposed to be easy. It's not Jesus going, oh, here's a huge concept you're never going to get, so I'm going to make it real simple by telling you a story. No, it's Jesus saying, here's a huge concept you can't truly get, so I'm going to tell you a story that you could get a hundred different ways. And that you'll have to wrestle with forever. And that the only way to really get to the bottom of it is to really try to investigate the heart of the parable. To really, and this is why context is king when you read parables. Now remember what you just read. One, three, seven, seventy-seven. Forgiveness is the theme. Jesus has said, if two or three of you could just get this together, heaven would move on your behalf. If you could flip this thing over, boom, this could explode. Something amazing could occur. And he tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. So if you will allow me, I'm going to do what I do. That is read the parable and talk my way through it. And I know that is a recipe for us to be here too long. So I'm going to try to limit my remarks and just keep the parable moving forward. But there's no way to do this without stopping a bit and talking. So this is a long story, I'll warn you. This is a parable that, that takes up verses 22 all the way through the end of Matthew 18, which is verse 35. So it's, it's not short, but man, is it worth it. So let's throw in Peter's question first. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to 70 times? Jesus says, and we've got this, our words right here. I do not say to you up to seven times, but 77 times. I don't like New King James. I'm not, I'm not convinced it's 70 times seven. We're going to say 77. I can say scholars are split. Let's go with the second one. Here's our story. Therefore, you see a therefore? Mark what's therefore. So that therefore means the stuff that just happened. One, three, seven, seven, seven. That's important. In light of this information and in light of our conversation, Peter, about how often you should forgive somebody, let me tell you a little story about forgiveness. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven... This is the description of the kingdom of God. It's like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Bookkeeper king. There's no other way to read this than bookkeeper king. He's going to settle accounts with his servants because bookkeepers settle accounts. It's tax season. You're going to go to your CPA. You're going to settle your books. Settle your accounts. This is what's happening. This is a bookkeeper king. 24. 
And when he began to settle his accounts, or let's say it this way, when he begun, when he had begun to balance his books, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's about, just for sake of argument, that's like $10 million. Jesus picks a number that to his audience was so absurd that everyone in the crowd laughed when he said it. It would be like going, um, you went to the bank and they told you you owed a trillion dollars on your house. And everybody goes, oh, a trillion dollars. There's no way you owe a trillion dollars. Okay, that's, he picks a humongous number. That's, and as he was not able to pay, of course, he's not able to pay because no one can pay it. As he's not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. Remember, we're dealing with a bookkeeper king. This is a type of the law. And under the law, the bookkeeper king, the books own you. And you are a slave, bought and sold under sin. That's a phrase we like to use in the New Code. Bought and sold under sin. So bought and sold that your whole, the whole paterfamilias of the Roman family, the whole father and all of his wife and kids and everything, it all belongs to the boss. He gets it all because the law owns you. You, you are crushed beneath the weight of what the books say about you. Bookkeeper God that's the only way payment could be made. And even that's not going to do it. 26. The servant therefore fell down before him. He said, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Which is ridiculous, because it was 10,000 talents. He can't pay it all. But that's his, his heart is, give me a shot. I'll work on it. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Pay attention to that. Stare at that for a second. The master was moved with compassion, released him, was no longer a slave, forgave him the debt. Doesn't require him to pay him back. Doesn't say, you owe me just the principal. Let's just hold off. Just take interest payments for a while. Payment plan. No. Move with compassion. This sounds a lot like Jesus. Move with compassion. Forgave him the debt. Release him from prison. This is grace. And then, the servant, next verse. The servant went out, notice but. Contrast, there's a darkness in the story. Jesus intentionally turns the story into the darkness. Because this is high flying, man. This is all grace, all grace, all grace, all grace. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. But, sharp left turn. The servant went out found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. That's 100 days pay. That's eh, three months worth of money for a day laborer. It's not a trillion dollars. I mean, it's doable. You can, you can pull this off. Found a fellow servant owed him 100 denarii. Laid hands on him, took him by the throat. Take a man by the throat, you're trying to kill him. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. That's the same thing he had said to his master, bookkeeper God, before bookkeeper God was moved with compassion, released him the debt, and set him free. But he goes out, grabs a man by the throat, give me my hundred denarii, please have patience on me, I'll pay you all. Surely verse 30 is him going, oh, of course I have patience on you. Of course I have mercy on you, because that's what happened to me. Here's where the story, here's where you need to remember about forgiveness and the inversion of forgiveness. Because the minute you step into the violence of gripping the throat, you jump back to Lamex 77. And you're, you had, you're right smack dab in the middle of the vortex of Jesus' grace 77, man. All you got to do is take it in. Like, he just forgave you the debt. He just released you from the obligation. He just was moved with compassion. You walked out. You're excited. And if you just reciprocate it you just flow in the unforced rhythms of that grace life is grand but right here is that dark moment where you reach out and you grab the throat this is the way of the world and you do exactly as Cain would do or Lamech would do and instead of saying what we hope he'll say in verse 30 instead he does this he wouldn't do it threw him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what had been done they were very grieved and they came and told their master all that had been done. I want to take a pause before I read on. I know I've been doing that the whole way through, but this is a crucial piece of information. 
when you forgive someone, you die. That's the heartbeat of forgiveness. No, I don't mean you fall over and die, but you die to the you that gets vengeance. See, there was a whole world out there of where you get what's coming to you and they get what's coming to them. There's a whole world and you dream of it. That's your, I'll pay them all back side. And when you forgive, you die. That guy, gone. He vanishes. He's no longer a possibility. Whenever this man asks his bookkeeper God for mercy, the bookkeeper God doesn't owe him mercy. He just gives it to him. He's moved with compassion. He releases his servant and he frees him from the debt. He dies to getting paid back. He wipes the book clean. He no longer is in the bookkeeping business. All that the man has to do is recognize that death and step into it. Step into the fullness of that death and join him. And, and I mean, join him in its fullness. Enjoy what the death gives you, but die too. This is why I tell you, Christianity is not just a system of beliefs. You don't just get to do this however you want to. Christianity has been invited into Jesus' death. It's Jesus going, come here, join me, step into my death, step into the fullness of my death. This man refuses. Watch the hell that is to pay and watch the wording. Watch it carefully. 32. His master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? Just as I had pity on you. This is what I did to you. This is what I was asking you to do to others. 34. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And this beautiful parable of grace becomes a stark parable of judgment as you watch Jesus say what happens as you get handed over to the torturers. You get handed over to the system you chose so that the system you chose will eat you alive. So that you must make a choice. You can either live in the 77-fold vengeance of Lamech, the system of this world, where they will torture you to death exponentially, or you can live in the palace of the, the God who's no longer a bookkeeper, who has died on your behalf, who has taken this into himself. My comments, my thoughts are these. If we cannot recognize the grace of God, who has died to bookkeeping, then we will refuse the forgiveness and we'll go on with our own bookkeeping ways. This is the point. This is what the man does. He doesn't recognize that God is no longer keeping books, and so he goes on being a bookkeeper. And much of our judgment to other people is a direct result of not realizing that God isn't holding things against us. And so much of our judgment simply shows how little we believe we are forgiven that if we could release people around us, it would be representative of people who know they are forgiven. When you meet people who are forgiving people, they are people who know they are forgiven. So it's not once in a while, it's always. Because this is a system of forgiveness. This is the kingdom forgiveness. It's a 77. It's, it's an endless thing, it's a cycle. But when you meet judgmental, cold, distant, condemning, you meet people who haven't accepted that they are freed from those things in their own walk. And they even say, well, you know, the Lord demands high things of us. That's why I'm this way to other people. Because they think that they serve a bookkeeper. And since they serve a bookkeeper, they think that everybody around them needs to keep tight books. These ways are the way of the world. What ways? Well, that's going about your own bookkeeping ways. The way of the world's bookkeeping ways, man. Get what's coming to you. We keep Strict records. And when we keep those ways, we're given over to the tormentors. So you must choose which way you're going to live, the way of Cain and Lamech or the way of the kingdom of forgiveness. I want to close tonight with a little series of paragraphs. I was going to put them all on one screen, but I thought it would take up a lot of room. This is, this is Robert Farrar Capon. Um... I didn't think I could say it this well. 
I certainly can't say it better. Um, so in closing, I want to land on his thoughts about this parable and how they are representative of heaven and hell or the ways of God versus the ways of the kingdoms of this world. This is a beautiful way to say this. In heaven, there are only forgiven sinners. There are no good guys, no upright, successful types who, by dint of their own integrity, have been accepted into the great country club in the sky. <laughs> there are only failures, only those who have accepted their deaths in their sins and who've been raised up by the king who himself died that they might live. But in hell, too, there are only forgiven sinners. Jesus on the cross does not sort out certain exceptionally recal recalcitrant parties and cut them off from the pardon of His death. He forgives the badness of even the worst of us, willy-nilly. And He never takes back that forgiveness, not even at the bottom of the bottomless pit. I love the idea. In heaven is full of forgiven sinners. In hell is full of forgiven sinners. Because forgiveness is a universal blanket. It's Jesus says, I'm going to forgive them all. Now, the difference is what are you going to do with it? Well, Capon goes on. The sole difference, therefore, between heaven and hell is that in heaven, the forgiveness is accepted and passed along. While in hell, it is rejected and it's blocked. In heaven, the death of the king is welcomed and becomes the doorway to new life in the resurrection. In hell... The old life of the bookkeeping world is insisted on and becomes forever the pointless torture it always was. I hope you're catching on. This is not the afterlife. Okay. I mean, you can call it that. This is, the, this is life. You can live the life of heaven, 77, forgiveness. Or you can live the life of hell, Lamech 77, non-forgiveness. Your choice. What are you going to do with it? Upon one more paragraph. There's only one unpardonable sin, and that is to withhold pardon from others. The only thing that can keep us out of the joy of the resurrection is to join the unforgiven servant in his refusal to die. God bless the late, great Robert Farrar Capon. What a, what a powerful way to close that. I couldn't do that well, and certainly not better, so let's pray. Father, what a word tonight that you put into my spirit a long time ago. Well, it feels like it's, it's not that long ago, but it feels long. That you are dead to bookkeeping and I should be too. Forgive me where I'm not dead to bookkeeping. The worst that I am with it is with me. I'm, I'm always keeping books with Paul. And I need to receive your forgiveness. And I need to receive it, not so that you'll do it, but because you've done it. Make me dead to bookkeeping because you are. I want to live in the 70 times and seven times forgiveness of the kingdom. I want to live in that forgiveness where it's just exponential. It just flows over my heart. I want to receive it like that, and I want to give it out like that so that it overflows the heart of my neighbor and then overflows the heart of their neighbor. And that if we could do this, if we could live this out, we would finally reverse the curse that has so plagued the human family. The revenge and retribution of Cain and Lamech that grows with each generation until we're all blind. Father, I want a little heaven on earth, the heaven where forgiveness is the key, where I receive it and where I pass it on, where there are only forgiven sinners, no good guys, just those who have received it. And Father, for all of my areas of hell, the places where I don't accept it and I don't receive it, and therefore I don't do a very good job at giving it out. Let me have a fresh revelation of your death in that hell so that I can realize my only hope out of there, my only way out of there is resurrection, to step into your death and join you. We thank you that you're dead to bookkeeping. Help us be too. In Jesus' name, amen.